Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of High School Talk, your number one source of college football news on YouTube. I'm Nate Dog, with my co-host, Devin Eric D. Jackson, to bring you the latest of Week 3 Recap. Today, we'll not just be covering four, we're adjusting our coverage to cover five. D, how are you doing today? I'm really good, Nate. You know, we had a great weekend of college football this weekend. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to, to talk, you know, about it and get, the, uh, get to the recap. And... Yeah, I mean, D, if I could sum up this past weekend in one sentence, it would be Lions, Tigers, Cougars, oh my. And boy, do we have it all. We're going to head to the swamp. We'll be in the Northeast. We'll be in the Northwest. We'll take you down to Miami. So, D, Without further ado, let's jump right into it. We start off down at South Beach, where Michigan State came on the road to take the Miami Hurricanes. And D, there was no sunshine uh, anywhere near sight for the home team and the Hurricanes. D, what's your take on this game? Yeah, man, uh, this game, you know, it was it was pretty easy to call. You know, we we both called it, and you know. Miami just really wasn't playing well. They didn't look good, um, you know, and Michigan State was, you know, you know, we talked about how, you know, Peyton Thor Thorne would have to come out and play, you know, mistake-free football, and he did that plus more. You know, he threw for four touchdowns. Uh, he was 18 for, for 31 for 261 yards. So, you know, um, with that, you know, and them being able to run the ball at any point in time in which they wanted to, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty simple playing, you know, Michigan State just easily. Um, you know, wins the football game. Yeah, D. And, you know, Derek King had a great game. Uh, unfortunately, he had two interceptions that really cost the Hurricanes. Um, but some of the biggest takeaways for me on this game is, for one, Miami is most likely out of playoff contention now. But they still have a chance to win the ACC. They're going to have a chance to take on North Carolina here in a few weeks. I think it's October 2nd, if I'm – not mistaken, around that time, uh, maybe a little bit later. I can't remember exactly. But within the next few weeks, they're going to get their chance uh, to maybe take on Clemson and ACC championship. Uh, and, and two, Michigan State has really put themselves on the radar, uh, not only in the Big Ten, but nationwide. Mel Tucker has the Spartans rolling. I mean, they, they beat this team pretty good, 38 to 17. And yeah, like you said, Peyton Thorne, right on cue, four touchdowns, zero interceptions to continue uh, his great season. Also, you got a great running back in Kenneth Walker, who, uh, backstory, only had one Division One scholarship coming out of high school by Wake Forest, decided to transfer to Michigan State. They really liked what they saw. And now, D, you're looking at a guy who could probably start at really any Power Five conference school right now. Uh, so, so props to, to Ken. Walker and uh, that Michigan State team. Mel Tucker has them rolling. And finally, D, uh, the biggest takeaway is Manny Diaz uh, is no doubtedly on the hot seat. He might be receiving mm -hmm. uh, that pink slip, as a lot of people will say, <laughs> very quickly uh, if he doesn't turn this program around. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely on the hot seat, man. I mean, you know, they couldn't run the ball. You know, we talked about Mel Tucker and, you know, him being a defensive mind. Miami couldn't run the ball. You know, they rushed for 52 yards. Um, you know, Michigan State could run the ball. And they, you know, they ran for a, 193 yards. So that was a big difference. And, you know, like you said, you know, Michigan State is on the radar now. Absolutely. Indeed. You know, they follow up this past week. Uh, they go back home where they will take on the Cornhuskers, who played the Sooners pretty tight this past weekend. So, uh yeah, looking forward to that matchup coming up. So, D, we head a little bit north to the Swamp in Gainesville, where the number one Crimson Tide came in to play the 11th ranked, the 11th ranked Gators. Uh, and, you know, surprisingly, the Gators held their own. They did lose this game 31-29, but uh, struggled in the first quarter, but came back to, uh, to make their push. D, what are some of your takeaways from this game? Yeah, Nate, um, I just want to, you know, sincerely apologize to Emory Jones um, <laughs> and all the Florida fans. I didn't think this one was going to be close at all. You know, I thought that, you know, uh, Alabama was just going to come in. And even at the beginning, it looked like they were going to come in and, and straight dominate. 
and, you know, walk out of there with a victory. But, you know, Florida has some resiliency. Um, Emory Jones, although he didn't throw the ball, you know, great, but he uh, was able to run the ball effectively. Um, you know, the, the, my biggest takeaway for this game is, you know, Bryce Young being able to go into a, a crazy environment. And he didn't play great, but he played well enough and he played mistake free football. And, you know, him, him doing that, um, you know, allowed them to, to really win this game. So that, that was a, the, the big takeaway is that, you know, Bryce Young, a young player, can go in and, and play in a raucous environment and still be able to play mistake free football. And Emory Jones, you know, he, he played good, um, but he did, you know, have an interception. So that, you know, that, that definitely hurts you. So. Yeah. D, I mean, you know, like you said, Emory Jones has much improved uh, in the last two weeks uh, compared to how he opened up the season with four interceptions. Uh, I thought he played great. You know, like you said, he gave up one interception, but one thing that really surprised me was, Florida's ability to run the ball. They finish off the game with 245 yards uh, and total rushing yards. And against a Bama defense, who a lot of people thought was uh, the best Nick Saban has ever had, or at least in the top three. Uh, and, and I guess you could say the same uh, as a takeaway is, you know, who who is Alabama? You know, offensively, they, they looked decent, but uh, defensively, they like you said, they, they struggled. They, they only... Uh, like they gave up 245 yards rushing. Uh, and then offensively, what really surprised me too on Alabama was they only rushed themselves for 91 yards. And that's something that uh, we're not really used to. So yeah, I mean, great win for Alabama, but props again to the Florida Gators because they showed up. They were down 21 to three in the first quarter uh, and they did not back down at all. Uh, so we'll see how this Florida Gators team looks moving forward. They've got a couple key matchups coming up against, uh, Georgia, obviously in, in a few weeks. So yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that being said, we move on to our next game, which was in the Midwest, uh, where the number eight Cincinnati Bearcats took on the Indiana Hoosiers. Indeed, this was kind of a game where we thought it was going to be a quarterback matchup, uh, but both quarterbacks really struggled in this game. D, what are your takeaways from this game? Uh, my big takeaway um, is you, you really got to try to play mistake-free football. You know, that, that's a, a, a key. Uh, Michael Penix Jr. came in, you know, he, he's coming back from ACL injury. He still doesn't look very good. He's throwing some very, very bad football. It's just, you know, putting it up in the air and, you know, not – He's just not playing mistake free. He's playing more carefree and just throwing the ball anywhere. Um, he had three interceptions this game. Uh, you know, at first he looked good. Indiana looked good. I think they were up uh, 14 to zero. Um, but, you know, Cincinnati came back, you know, after that uh, early Desmond Ritter interception and they just came and they just start plowing away, plowing away, plowing away. And, and you know, they were able to, you know, take over the, the, the big game changer was when, um, you know, Trey Tucker had the, um, kick return the 99 yard uh, kick return that was a, a huge change in the game and uh, you know momentum plays like that on special teams are, are huge so um, Cincinnati looked good man and uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how they're going to look for the rest of the season at that number eight spot. Yeah D I think a lot of people expected the Indiana Hoosiers to play a lot better but unfortunately Michael Penix was not the quarterback we thought he was going to be this year again three interceptions this game Cincinnati special teams and defense won uh, the game for them. And, and like my high school football coach told me a long time ago, uh, if you can win two out of the three phases of the game, you'll win the game. And that's exactly what they did offensively. Ritter struggled, but they made up for it with their defensive play and special teams with a 99 yard kick return uh, from Trey Tucker, like you mentioned. And another thing is uh, Indiana, very disappointing in terms of, you know, who they played this year. They've now lost two uh, games this year against AP ranked teams. Uh, and I don't think it's going to get any better for the Hoosiers going forward. So we'll see. We'll see if they can make a bowl game and finish off with seven, maybe six wins. But uh, yeah, great win for the Cincinnati Bearcats. And uh, to me, I think they still have a lot more to prove. They'll have their chance in two weeks against Notre Dame. And I know a lot of people are excited about that one. If Cincinnati can beat Notre Dame in two weeks, 
then I'll begin to tip my cap to them and uh, really have them on my radar as a potential playoff team. So D, we stay uh, somewhat in the Big Ten and the SEC as well, as we go to uh, Happy Valley, where the Auburn Tigers came into town to play Penn State in the wideout game. One of the most infamous and electric atmospheres you will ever see in not only in college football, but really in all world sports. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, it gave me chills when I watched it Saturday night. But yeah, a lot of great takeaways from this game too, D. What were your thoughts on this game? Um, you know, it's going to be always a constant theme about turnovers, man. And, you know, Auburn was playing really, really well. Uh, they tried to get a little bit fancy, uh, you know, tossed the ball on a reverse to Kobe Hudson. He got a little too fancy, fumbled the ball. Uh, and that was, I think, the big game changer right there. Um, but I just want to give props, man. I want to give props to Sean Clifford, man. He came out and he played exceptional. Um, you know, throwing the ball to Jahan Dotson, he's, you know, he, he played exceptional. He, had, you know, he was 28 for 32, uh, you know, 280 passing yards and two touchdowns. He, he, he had an interception at the end of the half, but, you know, it really didn't uh, – Auburn didn't have a chance to capitalize on it because it was the end of the half. So, um, Sean Clifford uh, definitely deserves uh, his week three uh, flowers because he, he came out and played exceptional in a great environment for his home team, and that's how a senior is supposed to step up. So. Yeah, D, it's like you read my mind. Uh, right here in my notes, I said yeah. Penn State has found a quarterback in Sean Clifford. And <laughs> yeah. You're exactly right. They, they have found the missing piece to their puzzle. Their defense looks stout, uh, but yeah. Sean Clifford really shined in this game. And, and, and I also want to give credit to, you know, uh, Penn State's offensive line. They really protected Sean Clifford and allowed him to do the things that he was able to do. Um, but on the other side of the ball, I really want to give credit to Auburn. I don't think a lot of people expected Auburn to be not just in this game, but I don't really know if they expected anything from the season. Uh, they've got a bright future with head coach Brian Harson. So, I mean, yeah, they only allowed 85 yards uh, rushing on, on defense. So, you know, a lot, like I said, a lot of great things to look forward to. Bo Nix looked decent. Uh, didn't play as poorly as I thought he would with such a large crowd and, and loud atmosphere. Uh, still completed 56% of his passes uh, for 185 yards. So, yeah, look for the Auburn Tigers to, uh, to make a push this season. I don't know if they'll finish in the top 10 or top 15, but uh, I think they really have a great shot at at least staying in the top 25, uh, needless to say. So, yeah, great job by great team by both teams in this matchup. I thought they both played really well. And yeah, I think Penn State is definitely the favorite moving forward uh, into the season to win the Big Ten Championship. They have to play on the road at Ohio State. That's gonna be the biggest matchup. So we'll see that in a few weeks as well. It's gonna be a great one. So then D, we head back out to the Northwest where the second whiteout occurred. And if you were lucky enough to stay up and watch this game, it really did not disappoint us. It was the matchup of two quarterbacks between Jaden Daniels and Jaron Hall. And man, did they both deliver. D, what are some of your takeaways from this game? Uh, big takeaway, man. Jaron Hall, you know, he played better than Jaden Daniels. Um, you know, like we said, both of those guys are extremely explosive quarterbacks, extremely uh, explosive athletes. Um, they both threw it, two interceptions. Um, but at the same time, you know, one of Jaron's interceptions was at the end of the half, uh, kind of like with, um, you know, with, with Sean Clifford. So it really didn't hurt, uh, BYU as much as Jaden Daniels interceptions did, but Arizona state, uh, you know, as a team, they had four turnovers, you know, they lost two fumbles, they had two interceptions. And so when you do that, you know, and you only lose by 10 points, it's like, what, you know, what if, or what could have happened? You know, and so it, it's, you know, it, it's, it really sucks for them. But, you know, they, they, they have a, a long slate of Pac-12 games ahead of them. So they're going to have to, you know, come back and, and uh, you know, get back on the horse and, and, and keep playing hard because, you know, you never know what will happen in the Pac-12. But shout out to BYU, man. Uh, I'll never pick against them again if we ever pick, <laughs> if we ever pick 
um, those uh, BYU, I always got to go BYU, man, because they keep on just shattering my my picks. So shout out to them, man. Shout out to Jaron Hall. So yeah, D. You know, uh, thankfully I'm two and zero with BYU at this point, uh, <laughs> and I would highly <laughs> advise that you pick the Cougars as well moving forward. They are a great team, and might I mention. This is the first time in BYU football history that they have won back-to-back games against AP-ranked teams. So uh, congrats to the Cougars. That's huge uh, for that program, considering, you know, what they've done in the past, yet they've never accomplished this. Jaron Hall looked great, like you said. uh, And Jaden Daniels on the other side of the ball for Arizona State struggled. I want to give props to the BYU Cougars first and foremost. They played an excellent game. But now let's really talk about what happened in this game. And that was the fact that Arizona State, they really beat themselves. I was extremely disappointed with the lack of discipline under Herm Edwards uh, for the Sun Devils. Might I mention, they had 16 penalties in this game. One six, four, get this, 121 yards. And when you have something like that, you're just not going to win the game. And, and, and then on top of that, they fumbled the opening kickoff, which gives BYU the football within their own 15, an easy seven points to start the game. D, uh, like I said, undisciplined, and unacceptable for Herm Edwards with his background. He's got to get this team straightened out because they've got the talent, like you said, to make a push in the Pac-12 and possibly take on Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. They've got a ways to go, but man, did they have a lot to work on. Well, that's a wrap for today. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to get into our week four pickums. And boy, do we have some marquee matchups, including Wisconsin, Notre Dame, Texas A&M, and Arkansas, and a few others that you won't want to miss out on. Make sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Subscribe down below. And make sure that bell notification is turned on so you can stay up to date with our latest posts. Until then, stay safe. This is Nate Dog and D signing off.